Uh, this is, uh, he says then in the ninth verse, he said, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. How many believes that? And somebody said, well, I don't feel like that. That's all right. We're going to get to that too. But I want you to, I want to take you back if I can and maybe walk you through up to where we're at today and just, just see if the, if the Lord would just put things together for us. And how many believes the Lord will speak to us? Amen. Three people. We're going somewhere this morning. And so, he, now, uh, when the writer was writing this, uh, and, and he's, he's elaborating on, on a certain group of people, if you will. And, and he's, he's speaking to those people, as you can tell, just as their royalty. And I don't know about you, but I, I believe that, G, that God's people is royalty. What about you? Now, I do know this. Not everybody is God's people, right? Now, I didn't make those rules up. Uh, I just preach the word, but it's, I believe it's pretty evident today, regardless of how you feel about God's grace and His mercy, that not everybody is royalty, not everybody is God's people. And so in, in this text, he's, he's speaking about a, a peculiar people. That's number one. Now, uh, the, a peculiar people is a little bit different than maybe even how that you've understood it in times past. Uh, if you was if you was raised Pentecostal apostolic, then um, you know the way we were sort of brought up was peculiar people meant you know you're peculiar by the you know the way you dress, and no doubt we we believe in separation, um, you know. But but you're made peculiar sort of by your doctrine. Um, somehow that made you peculiar because you were adapted to certain doctrinal beliefs. But but I want to present you something. A little more differently this morning from the text that I believe that we could grow from. But he, he's talking about a peculiar people. And the reason why he's talking about talking to them as if they're peculiar. Because this peculiar means a people that I have formed for myself. They are my very own. Now that's a little different, isn't it? Um, these people I have formed for myself. How many believes you're, you're created by God? So these are people that I have formed for my own self. They're my very own. That, that's how peculiar you are. You're his very own. But before we, it's, it's le- at least in the history book that we have called the Holy Bible, that there was a time when the Lord spoke, spoke to a man named Abram. And he said, Abram, he says, Get ye out of the land of the Chaldeans. And he says, and go into the land of Canaan. And I'm going to create a people from you. And the Bible records and history would further support that the Chaldeans was a a bunch of idolaters. The Lord was telling Abram, he was saying, look, I've, now furthermore, if you could have, dissected the Lord's mind in that moment and really saw what the Lord was wanting to do, then we would have understood, or rather Abraham would have understood even more perfectly that God wasn't just saying, Abraham, I want you and your family to, to get away from the Chaldeans. They're a bunch of crazy folk. But, but, but rather the Lord was separating a seed line, if you will. God was separating a chosen people that would forever be separated because God had created them for His own. Are you with me so far? So uh, He says, leave the Chaldean people and go into Canaan. And then the Lord began to speak with Abram and He began to direct Abram and eventually named his, changed his name to Abraham And he began to speak prophetic things to him as such as, look, from your loins, your seed line, it's going to be as the numbers of the sands of the beach or the stars in the heaven. And I'm going to create from you 
a, a royal family, if you will, a royal bloodline, a royal priesthood that will forever give me praise and honor. How many believes that's the Lord today? And he says now, ye are a chosen generation. Now, if you follow from Abraham right up until this text was written, I'm here to tell you the people of Israel didn't always feel chosen. Do you always feel chosen? Or is there some times in your life you don't feel too chosen? And I, I, re, I remember uh, one instance, ladies and gentlemen, when Israel for over 400 years is in Egypt. You remember that? Now, Brother Cantrell, for 400 plus years, they're in Egypt. And they've absolutely adapted to the mindset of a slave. Now, they wasn't in any kind of control there. They, they didn't really have no, uh, if you will, they had no people in higher power or the echelon or any government. They, they was absolutely enslaved to a system that was anti-Jehovah God. And, and during this, it wasn't just for 30 years or 40 years, but it was for 400 plus years they were enslaved. But ladies and gentlemen, that did not still change the fact that they were chosen. How many is with me so far? We're getting to a point. And so it didn't matter what slavery they was in. It didn't matter where they was at in life. It did not matter that each and every one of them, their brothers, their sisters were being abused were dying of starvation and various diseases, was getting the whip on their back. The word of God was, ye are a chosen generation. Now, I want you to put this in modern times and, and, and think of it in a, in a modern perspective. We don't always feel chosen. We don't always feel blessed. We don't always feel like the government is on our side. We don't always feel like the elected officials is, is who God might would want us to have or, or who we need as far as to advance and be kingdom minded and, and be able to exploit the gospel in a way that it could change lives. We may even be martyred. Who knows? You know, you may be going to real persecution and, and absolutely have some form of, of religious slavery put on you. But ladies and gentlemen, one thing is to be sure, ye are the chosen generation of God. Uh, the, the writer is wanting to Ferment in your minds is it does not matter about your surroundings. It does not matter about where you're at or, or where you're going or who may be even in control of the world or the government in which you sit under because God has chosen you and God has called you holy and worthy. It don't matter what else is around you. In God, you are chosen. I mean, he's with me today. Israel was chosen while they were in, in Egypt, but they were not holy. You got me? They were chosen of God, but they were not holy unto God. They were living in a, a pagan and an idolatrous country. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the chosen generation, I want you to watch this, is the offspring of one common parent. The offshoots of one original stock. Are you hearing me? Well, what is a chosen generation? See, I know what you're thinking, ladies and gentlemen. You, you, you're thinking, well, you know, I was adopted, or I was this, or I was that, and, and, and that all may be the case, ladies and gentlemen, but, but I'm of this mindset because I've actually read the Bible. I'm of this mindset that, that I come from a unique lineage, a unique bloodline that goes all the way back to Adam. And I believe, ladies and gentlemen, how many believes that in here today? I mean, how many species you think was created of the human race? And, and so I, I believe that, that my bloodline will go all the way back to the very first man and the very first woman. And I believe that God created me in the likeness and in the image of himself. And I believe that I come from that one common parent, that one offshoot of original stock, and that original stock was the Son of God. How many believes that today? Now, to say that is to say this. 
It does not matter where, how far humanity has been degraded in evil and in idolatry. You can take it to every level, every depth you can imagine. Israel always backslid on God and chased idolatry. That the whole book of Hosea is full, uh, full of the fact that Israel always turned their back on God and hoard after other gods. But the one main thing always transcend any amount of sin is God could not deny Himself. And when he seen his people, he could only see himself because they were of that offspring, Jesus Christ. My God. Amen. Think about it. Think about it. So you're a chosen generation. Uh, you're, you're, you're hand chose by God. Now, this mindset and this revelation tripped people up all the way from the beginning of time. We read in the couple verses before the ninth verse that uh, it is a, it's a precious stone. It's a lively stone. The writer wants you to understand that this is a building that is constantly building. It never does get built. It's constantly, we're constantly working on it. The, the building isn't a church as a facility. The building is the revelation of who Jesus is. Are you with me? So it's a lively building. It's a lively stones. Meaning, ladies and gentlemen, throughout time, certain ministries have come forward with the great in-depth revelation of who Jesus really is. And they build upon the house. And others came and built upon the house. But in the process of building this house, guess what got hurt? Religion got hurt. Are you with me? Because they were offended by the gospel of who Jesus is. How many is with me today? It's amazing that grace can be offensive. It's amazing that mercy can be offensive. It's amazing that holiness can be offensive. It's amazing that sacrifice can be offensive. But when you already have your mindset of what Jesus looks like and he actually presents himself to you the way he really is, it can be offensive. Isn't that right today? All through the, the eons of time, He's been offensive. The Pharisees had it figured out, or so they thought. They felt like that the more they could be righteous as a person, the more they could sacrifice of themselves, the more they could please God. And the Bible says, Jesus speaking, unless your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no wise inherit the kingdom of God. But the Bible goes on to further say, it's not by works lest any man should boast. So the Pharisees missed it, did they not? So Jesus was coming and, and he was coming with the word that says, look, it don't matter how many Sabbaths you keep. It don't matter how much certain food and dietary programs you follow. It don't, it don't matter uh, how fervently and, and, and how greatly you follow these laws and these commandments. He said, unless you get Jesus Christ living inside of you, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now, you would think, ladies and gentlemen, that a person that wanted to follow the law to, to every little detail would be willing, even more than willing, to receive Jesus in their heart. But some of us is so blinded by the letter that we cannot see the light. I mean, he's with me today. Some of us is so blinded by what we've been taught and so blinded by what we've read that we cannot see the coming of the Lord. And he's screaming on his horse saying, ye are the chosen. Oh, think about it. So they were stumbling over him. Here was the one that had written the commandments. Here was the one standing in front of them that had visited with Moses on Zion. This is the one, ladies and gentlemen, that had led Egypt 
out of Israel or Israel out of Egypt. This was the one that had given Samson strength and, and had given Daniel fervent prayer time. This is the one that had sent angels from heaven to minister to the needs of the saints. He was standing right in front of the most studied people, the most learned people, the most educated people, but they tripped over him. They stumbled over him and they could not excel. That everyone that can hear and submit to the name of Jesus is the chosen people of God. My Lord, think about it. How many believe you're chosen this morning? Amen. He says, you're chosen, you're a royal priesthood. You know, that tripped them up. How could you say we're a priesthood? How could you say these people can be priests? Exodus 19 and 5 says, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then... You shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. How many believes that? Sixth verse. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. How many is with me today? And a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. You know know what, ladies and gentlemen? I almost titled this uh, the revealing of Israel. Israel's identity. Because you, you know what, it, what Israel means? It means to contend, to fight. Right? Because the Bible says that Jacob was contending with an angel. He was fighting with an angel. He was wrestling with an angel when the Lord, or rather the angel, changed his name. Is that right? And, and, and he said, you'll no longer be called Jacob, but you'll be called Israel. But Jacob was contending. He was fighting And the reason why he was wrestling with this angel, the reason why he was holding on to this angel with everything in him is because Jacob knew that something has to change in my life. Something's got to shift. I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, when when you're a person, when you're a family, when you're a group, when you're a church with a prophecy attached to you, you you will never be happy until you walk in the divine order that God has called upon you. What do you mean by that? What I mean, ladies and gentlemen, is Abraham had received a promise promise and prophecy of God that from his loins should come in a nation that would absolutely be separated unto God. And Jacob is here, and this turmoil in his spirit and in his mind and in his life, he was living in hell. He was in fear of his brother. He had a reputation to try to live up. He, he was, all he could think about was the exploits of his daddy and his granddaddy. And he's being looked at among the community as a deceiver and a liar and a supplanter. His life is in a turmoil. He's looking in the mirror of life. Am I really chosen? Am I really a royal priesthood? Am I really a holy nation? It did not matter what he was to everybody else. It only mattered what he was to God. Come on, somebody. What we'll find, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that, that this, it wasn't enough. Nothing never is enough when you're attached to a prophecy. Nothing's never, you, life won't ever be enough. Clubbing won't be enough. Sleeping around won't be enough. Sexual this and that won't ever be enough. You'll always have a void. You'll always have a missing piece because there's a a prophecy attached to you and that is God's divine order chasing you and trying to harness you because he said you're chosen. He can't lie. He can't fail. He can't falter. He can't stumble. Whatever he says is written in heaven and will forever be law. Give him some glory. Amen. It's providential. God is a God of providence and divine justice and jurisdiction of all humanity. And so he was beckoning, if you will, he was beckoning to Jacob in a way that only Jacob understood because, ladies and gentlemen, Jacob was the one wrestling. Are you with me? 
He was the one wrestling. Galatians 4 says, I'm going to start in the second verse. We're going to come back to the first verse. He says, we're under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Third verse. Even so we, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. You ever been in bondage to the elements of the world? Maybe you are this morning. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth the Son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them. Everybody say redeem them. That were under the law. That we might receive the adoption of sons. That, that fifth verse says a lot. Even the ones that were under the law, even the ones that was following the law, without the redemption of Israel, without the redemption of the sons of God, could not be adopted as children. First verse. Now I say that the heir, everybody say heir. As long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. Are you hearing that right now? Now this I say that you're an heir. How many knows what an heir is? How many knows what uh, the Lord of all is? All right, he says, look, as long as you're a child, you differ nothing from a servant. He's not saying as long as you're four years old, as long as you're eight years old, or as long as you're 12 years old. He's not speaking of age as we consider the age of a, a boy or a girl or a man or a woman. But he's saying, as long as you're spiritually a child. How many is with you today? As, as long as, as you're not awakened to your divine inheritance. As long as some of you is playing religion instead of playing relationship. As long as some of you are just uh, damping around the, the pool instead of diving in and receiving what there, there's a servitude place that you can have in the body of Christ. And then there's a leadership position that you can fall into and become the sons of God. My, 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 my. It's a timing. It's all about timing. You're always chosen. You're always royal. You're always holy. But there has to be a time element is involved. As long as you're a servant, you differ nothing from the heir. Your heir, even though you feel as you're a servant, it doesn't change the fact. Notice this first verse. It doesn't change the fact that you're Lord of all. Are you with me? How many is with me? <laughs> so he's saying, <laughs> he's saying, look, Jacob's wrestling. Jacob's upset. Jacob's in turmoil. Because Jacob knows. I fought for the birthright. I don't care about the blessing. I want the birthright. How many is with me? They can have the blessing. Have all the blessing you want. I want the birthright. The birthright is the name. It's the covenant. Are you with me? Amen. Now, the Bible says that Isaac, Jacob's father, he still had the anointing. He could bless. Isn't that right? Esau came in and he said, well, can't you bless me? Yeah, I'll bless you. The Bible says he blessed him. And guess what? He was blessed. Right? But ladies and gentlemen, no matter what kind of blessing he put on Esau, he couldn't reverse the birthright. Are you with me today, saints? And Jacob felt like a supplanter. You cannot do what he did and not feel like a deceiver. You can't do what he did and not feel like a liar and a cheat. But ladies and gentlemen, sometimes what you have inside of you is greater than what name's been placed on you. Sometimes, saints of God, you gotta live through your reputation. You gotta walk through your circumstance. You gotta walk through your hell. Live through your hell. Live through the disaster because you have his name and it's the name above every name that every knee's gonna bow to this birthright. Every tongue's gonna confess to this birthright. Think about it. You look among your charismatic brothers and sisters. Ladies and gentlemen, just, I'm going to give you this for free. 
They have blessings. They have miracles. They have signs. They have wonders. They have prophecies that come to pass. They have masses of people that, that come and go to church and, and pay offerings and build big cathedrals and, and, and colleges, etc., etc. It looks as if, ladies and gentlemen, that, that they have everything going for them. Don't mistake the blessings of Esau with the birthright of Jacob. Don't mistake it. It's one thing to be blessed. It's another thing, ladies and gentlemen, to have his name in your forehead. I'm going to tell you, I won't trade the birthright for the blessing any day. I'll walk through hell. I'll go through a desert. I'll be all alone. I'll be wondering where my family is, where my loved one is. But I ain't giving up the birthright because in the end, that's the only people that's going to stand is those that have the covenant of God. My, 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 my. Think about it. Think about it. But ye are. Everybody say, I am. A chosen generation. I'm a royal priesthood. Could you imagine when he says, you're all priests now. Them Pharisees went crazy. Pharisee says, who's your daddy? Who's your mother? Well, I'm a McKinney. You're not a Levite. You can't make an office or offering like a priest. You hear me? You're not a Levite. And we have a priest in here this morning. Right? Nino priest. He could make an offering. Right? Sammy priest. Right? McKinney's? No. Not a chance, right? The Pharisees are saying, you trying to tell these people, give these people false hope that they can be priests? You trying to give these people false hope that they can be kings? That's what the book of Revelation says. He's made you kings and priests to our God and to His Christ. That's what Exodus 19 and 6 was saying as well. The Pharisees like, no, no, no. See, they were stumbling over this. There's no way. You'll always have to come through the Levitical order. They, what they didn't understand is what was standing in front of them was the end to the Levitical order. And so they just couldn't get the fact that, wait, wait, no, no. We've always had somebody like, you know, the Levites, you know. And that's just how it's always been. Blinded, see. Blinded by, by what's always been. And they said, surely, no, 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 you're wrong. You're a heretic. You're a crazy man. And everybody that follows you is going straight to hell. Are you with me? And he says, I'm, they're stumbling over it. They're killing themselves over it. But he says, but you're a royal priesthood. Now notice, I'm going to need you to get this in your spirit. But ye are a royal priesthood. It don't matter what you think about yourself. Ye are a royal priesthood. And so, they said, there ain't no way. There's no way in the world that we could be priests. And, and here's the sacrifice, the last sacrifice. Standing in front of them. His name is Jesus Christ. And he's saying, for instance, to Nicodemus, look, you can't even see what I'm talking about. Much less enter what I'm talking about without a born again experience. You, you're going to have to be born again. And when you get born again, there's something going to enter you. There's something going to take a control of your heart and your mind. And you're going to see me as I am. And you're going to start trotting around the dinner table saying, I am royalty. I am a priest. I am a holy nation. Because God has made me holy. He did it. Think about it. There's no way in the world you can be a, a priest because that destroys everything. The Lord's like, it don't destroy nothing. It fulfills everything. Did you think you was going to operate? Think about this. 
Pharisees, did you think you was going to operate that like that and that capacity doing those kind of sacrilegical things and, 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 and that's how it was going to be for, from then until forever? D- don't you know, didn't you know enough about me to know I'm of God of variety? I'm an I'm a, I'm a always changing, ever evolving God? And, and to say and, and to believe that you have me figured out already makes you look smaller than what you really are. The simple-minded saints of God, the simple-minded people that just choose to believe the word of God, they're the ones that will see God in all his glory. It ain't the people that feel like they have it all figured out. I've got it all figured out. Us four and no more. They ain't nobody going but us. They ain't nobody going to make it but according to how I live and how I dress and how I react, etc. Those are the very people that will miss the harvest, that will miss the coming of the Lord, that will miss the revelation of Jesus. They're stumbling over what the man can do rather than what God has already done. Think about it. For me to say that the way that I live and the way I conduct myself gives me access into the portals of God is to say that God's blood really don't mean nothing. That God's spirit really isn't efficient. That it really ain't nothing to do with God. It's everything to do with me. But while I was in my sin, he said I'm a chosen generation. While I was in my sin, he said I'm a royal priesthood. While I was in my sin, he said I'm a holy nation. Now I live my life for him because he died for me. Give him some praise. My God. In Exodus 19, he's saying, I'm going to make you a priesthood. Can you even count how many times the Israel of God backslid from that moment till day to today? More than we can count. Amen. Did the Lord change his mind? Could the Lord not see their idolatry, their wicked ways? Eventually we have to reconcile this in our minds and begin to see that yes, God has in fact chosen a people. And no matter how far they go, they're still chosen. Are you with me? Brother, you said, somebody said, well brother, you sound like you can just do anything at this church. No, no, no. It's the contrary. I believe in this church and preach in this church, you ain't going to do nothing but what God called you to do. Some of us is just in rebellion right now. Some of us is just in despair right now. Some of us is getting drugged through the briar patch. Some of us is wrestling with all kind of things and we don't know where it's coming from. We don't know why we got anxiety. We don't know why we got depression. We don't know why we've been struck with some illness. I'm here to tell you, you're chosen. And when you're chosen, God can't go back on his word. He's bringing you home. You might as well surrender to the providence of God. You're chosen. You're royal. You say, well, brother, I just don't believe that a person can live like the devil all of their life. And then in the 11th hour, per se, enter into the warm embrace of the church and be instated as a son or daughter of God. And then we just treat it as if nothing ever happened. I say, oh, I, I know that spirit, you know. You, you know, you could tell when someone's speaking from a, a religious mindset. I said, but, but you know, it's something. What about Paul? Paul's own testimony was he caused people to blaspheme. His own testimony was he was a murderer. His own testimony. He says, I'm ashamed. I'm further ashamed. I'm a greater sinner than anyone's ever put on shoes. But thanks be to God, his mercy, his grace, his divine providence saved me, situated me into his promise. And now I proclaim the gospel. I've espoused you to one husband. I am the man of God for this age. My God. And it's because Paul and Peter sat around tables 
late at night and talked about we're chosen. Peter, a fisherman. There you go. A rough old fisherman that God said, Peter, follow me. Peter walked with him approximately three years. Peter, who do you say that I am? He went from a rough old fisherman to saying, you're Christ. You're the Son of God. How many is with me? My, my. Everybody that saw Peter, they didn't soon forget what kind of guy he was. Just because you get saved and commit your heart to the Lord, people don't just forget about who you were. But it don't, again, it doesn't matter what they remember. It don't matter what they say. Why? Because ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says, you will be persecuted for my name's sake. I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, oftentimes persecution is God's way of making you. Persecution is God's way of showing you that you actually are greater than who you think you are. When you live through something, when you live through a trial, when you live through a devastation, when you live through a turmoil, it is God's badge of honor saying, look, you didn't lose your faith, you didn't lose your way, you didn't lose your ingredients to who you are, you're chosen, you're royalty, you're a nation, Continue. it is your badge of honor from God. Give him some praise. Is simply an example of Christ's suffering. Again, I'm going to hit you with this. It weeds out who is for God and who is not. I want you to know something. Judas could have never lived under persecution. Peter could. Judas couldn't. Are you with me? Esau could have never lived under persecution. Jacob could and did. Esau could not. Cain could have never lived under persecution. Abel could and did. Cain could not. You know why? In each of these individuals, they all despised the birthright. How I many is it? Think about it. The, the, the birthright is almost as if it's an unsaid covenant that flows with inside of a man and woman's DNA that no matter how far they go into the world, there's always a silver line attached. Are you with me? There's an umbilical cord attached to God that's never, never quite severed. And so they're still getting life from him. They're still getting inspiration from him. They're still feeling conviction from him. There's a thumping in their bosom. There's a thumping in their spirit saying, come back to God. The birthright, ladies and gentlemen, is infringed in your DNA and it will not allow you to abort God's will in this life. My God, saints of God. Think about it. As the writer said, Solomon, you never let the silver cord be loosed or the bowl be busted. He was speaking of his bowels, his compassion and suffering that he felt for Jesus, but also the lifeline between him and Jehovah. And he said, never let this be loosed. Think about that, young preachers. And so here we are today in this text and Ye are a chosen generation. With everything that is happening around us, the last year, the pandemic, the election, all the things, all the stuff we're hearing about global resets, and now they're wanting to take children that are conservative and reprogram their minds to think in a more liberal, left-leaning I don't even know what the ideology. They, they, they realize, and I read an article that Glenn Beck of the, of the Blaze, he published. He got a hold of some, some articles that they were writing. The Democrat, the left-leaning liberal mob was communicating back and forward. And they have finally identified, listen closely, they finally identified 
what is driving the conservative right. They finally identified the enemy and they have put it pen to paper because now there's a bullseye plan encircled around one group and they have finally come out and said we see our problem we didn't realize it until a Trump presidency but now we see it and they said it's, it's the most vibrant it's the most alive it's the most energetic and what they said is their problem is the church folk Ain't that something? It's church people. And we only have three church people in here. That's why all, only three of y'all clapped. The rest of y'all just show up, see what's going to be said next. But they've identified the problem. The problem is Jesus. No matter what shade you come from, no matter what shingle you got over your roof, there's one commonality among Christian religious people. And when they get together and they pray, they pray in Jesus' name. When they get together and sing, they sing in Jesus' name. When they get together and have a promotion, they start it with prayer. They start it with honor of the American flag. They start it with pledge allegiance. They start it with, with helping. They start it, they start it with humanitarian things. They are a people that troubles the devil greatly because ye are chosen. You're peculiar. You're different. You're set aside. You're hand chosen and handmade by the creator. You come from one stock. You come from one branch. You come from one DNA. And that is the DNA of the son of the living God. Come on, give him some praise. Hallelujah. He says... We've targeted our enemy. And our enemy is those religious folk. They're an enemy to everything we hold dear. We used to sing this song. Satan, your kingdom's coming down. <laughs> Satan, your kingdom's coming down. I just heard. From heaven today, Satan, your kingdom's coming down. How many is with me today? It's coming down. We've identified it. It has taken many years. It, is, it has taken many presidents. Listen to me. It's to, we've been through many Republican right-leaning presidents. We've seen all kind of red meat thrown out. We've seen the Tea Party. We've seen all these different little groups, you know, the uh, different boys and all the southern boys and rednecks and on and on and on. He says, but you know what? Something, something drastic took place in the last six years. And, and there was a trumpet that sounded and people began to get a, are you with me? And people began to get a backbone. People began to stand up. People begin to say, you ain't shutting my church down. You ain't shutting my prayer meeting down. You're not shutting my speech down. You're not shutting God down. I've heard the trumpet, not the president, but the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Come on, somebody. There's still enough people that have stirring in their bosom like Jacob that says, I'm not quitting until I get my name changed. You know what you're going to find? You're going to find in text. This is so interesting. You're going to find in text that even after Jacob's name was changed, when the Lord God spoke to Jacob, whose name had been changed, he still said, Jacob, Jacob. Ain't that something? His name had been changed. His name had been changed. But he still did not have faith to believe it. But ladies and gentlemen, the final days and hours of his life, 
when the Lord spoke to him now, it was different. And what had transpired from that moment of a ladder ascending and descending and a wrestle with an angel and dwelling in Canaan. And now he's living with his son Joseph who was born to preserve a remnant who was predestinated to have dreams and visions and prophecies that profounded the wise and stumped the astrologers, shut kings' mouths down and made princesses tremble, not knowing what would be the outcome of the greatest government the world had known up to that day. Here was this man, Joseph, who was accused, are you with me? Who was accused of rape, who was sold by his own brothers, committed to his mom and daddy as being murdered by a a rogue animal. Here was this son, this progenitor, born from the loins of Jacob, who was a supplanter and who was a deceiver, standing at the right hand of Pharaoh, controlling the entire government that would feed the world and save a remnant. Joseph had strength only from God and the covenant of the birthright. And in Jacob's final days, something has come alive in his heart and in his mind. And what it is, I'm no longer the supplanter. And when the Lord spoke to Jacob for the last time, he says, Israel, Israel, strengthen thyself. Are you with me? Why? Because Jacob finally realized he was never Jacob. I mean, he's with me. Jacob finally realized he was never Jacob. He was always Israel. Eventually, you're going to realize you've never been John. You've always been the Christ. Oh. Bible says I'm hid in him. I mean, he's with me. You, you realize, Brother Dole, you've never been Dole Life. You've always been Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. And when God, when we finally get that, God will speak to us differently. Right now, He has to speak to us in a servant's form. But He's getting ready to shake the heavens and the earth and speak to us like men, speak to us like women. And He's going to say, Son, arise. Daughter, arise, for the kingdom is yours. Give him some praise. Stand to our feet. God's good. Just continue to worship the Lord. Raise your hands. Raise your hands and let's just worship the Lord. He's good. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. God is good. Come on, let's lift our hands and let's call on the name of the Lord. I'm here to tell you this morning. I'm here to leave this with you this morning. You are royals. Not because I said it. Or not because a preacher said it. But because the word of God says it. And you need to look at the predicament that you're in. Look at the, the problems that are surrounding you. Oh, I've had to do this, my God. It's a detrimental thing to look at your problems. It's a horrible thing, a scary thing to look at your problems and say, I'm the reason. My alienation from God is reason that I'm where I'm at today. Some of us need to take inventory of our life, of our spiritual condition, of our natural condition, and put that in the hands of God, the one that We have to trust with everything and say, Lord, you didn't put me here for no reason. I didn't end up here just out of chance. But as Joseph was put here in prison and enslaved for a certain destiny in his life, so I have also been put in this predicament in my life this hell of my life for such a time as this because there's something in me that you want to bring to the surface there's royalty in me 